My name's Forrest, Forrest Gump. I'm Jennifer Brett from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, and I cover the film and entertainment industry in Georgia. Right now, we've got Hunger Games and Fast and Furious 7 and Dumb and Dumber 2 cranking up right in town. They're just, films in Georgia are just stacking up like planes over Hartsfield. So I'm so excited to, um, to talk with the panelists today about all sorts of um, topics impacting their industry. And we can just maybe um, start with just an introduction of who everybody is and, and how you're, you're fitting in. You want to just start at the end? I'll begin. Hi, I'm Dan Dobb. We're I'm the director of editorial at Turner Studios. Brian and Apple, a brand strategist at Full Screen, and just so you know what Full Screen is, we're a YouTube network, so we do content on YouTube. I'm Ashley Kohler. I'm a president and executive producer at Awesome Incorporated. We're an animated content provider, and we do promos and commercials, design promos and commercials. And we also, I'm also executive in charge of production at Vento Box Studios in Atlanta, which is also another animated content provider. Hi, I'm Suzanne Morris. I'm the vice president of operations at Deluxe Entertainment. Uh, Deluxe actually has three brands here um, called Beast, Company 3, which Billy Gaber is here representing, and uh, Method Studios. And collectively, we provide post-production services for television, film, and commercials. I'm Billy Gaber, and I work for Company 3, one of the brands that Suzanne mentioned. And uh, our specialization is really working um, as an extension of the camera department of productions, whether it be for uh, film, feature films, or for uh, television, or for commercials, uh, basically to help them deliver um, the content uh, in a manner that they uh, uh, creatively uh, are after. Thanks very much. Um, to, to kick us off, I wondered if we could start by talking about something that Joel sort of alluded to, this intersection of technology, you know, digital um, components. You know, what kind of challenges and opportunities do you see that bringing to your industry the, you know, the, the notion of, you know, audience-driven content and, and, of course, social media? So, I mean, that's a, that's a broad question, but just wanted to throw that open to the panel. Well, I'll take that. I mean, from the perspective of Company 3, we are, uh, in many cases, sort of forbidden from using social media uh, in terms of promoting uh, sort of our involvement, uh, mostly due to sort of uh, confidentiality and security regulations. So um, our, uh, our, our role in social media is, is fairly limited. Um, and when we do do that sort of thing, it's sort of very targeted. So social media is not really something that we play too heavily in. But as far as the intersection of, of technology and creativity, that is really kind of the, the heart of what we are. We sort of uh, go with that our uh, sort of pillars of our company are technology, artistry, and uh, global reach. So uh, to what Joel was saying about Atlanta and Atlanta not having to be Nashville or, or Los Angeles, or New York, that, that is true. But in the case of the projects that we're working on, and this is sort of key as to why I think the tax incentive is so worthwhile in this market is that the money that is paying for these projects is not coming from Atlanta, it's coming from other states. And so we have to connect the people generally who are paying for it uh, where they are because they're not traveling. So uh, one of the things that is unique about our group is that um, we have the technology, we have the artistry, and then we have this global reach that plugs in 
the people who are financing the projects into their projects to give them uh, moment by moment oversight of which uh, they demand in order to sort of uh, let loose uh, their projects in a state as far away from California as well. You know, I think I'm, I'm probably the closest to the other spectrum of uh, film and entertainment since it is YouTube that I work with. And um, <clears throat> what I would say is what we're trying to do is make the content on YouTube much better and up to par with what people are used to on TV and on film. So how do you make that happen? Well, you bring in companies like a full screen or some of our competitors, and you can also bring in funding from brands to help these creators who are on YouTube. I mean, the number of creators on YouTube right now making content is staggering. Within our network alone, we have 15,000 creators that are making content on a regular basis. And so how do you elevate that content to where people are seeing it and wanting to engage with it? Well, you get brands to fund it, one. <laughs> and two, um, you also help teach these creators what are the things that pull the levers. I mean, YouTube, as I'm sure everyone in this room knows, the content's shareable, it's, um, it's engageable, so you now can have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with a fan or a star that you know, TV or regular film may not lend itself to because there is such a separation between those celebrities and the average person. Um, a great example of how we're bridging it is we actually just launched George Takei's YouTube uh, show on Tuesday. So we're really excited because he had this great social presence. He has an amazing history. Um, in film, and he is 78 years old, and he has been able to make this jump into a YouTube millennial world where he's gonna be talking about um, technology and entertainment, and I, I think that's just a really good intersection of how you can bring all these things together. Sponsored by AARP, which is even more amazing. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, and that's where my role comes in as a brand strategist, is I bring all these people together to make this content. And um, the content's funny because we're actually having him have guest stars every week that are YouTubers. So from an audience standpoint, we're not starting from ground zero. He's bringing these YouTubers who have sometimes hundreds of thousands to millions of subscribers sit on his show each week. And so they're gonna sit and promote, hey, go check out this new show that's there. And it's a built-in media platform. Um, I think, you know, we kind of live at the intersection of, you know, kind of creativity, social media, and technology, Turner. Uh, you know, Second Screen, F, Conan, Falling Skies, and whatnot. I think those are uh, the kind of things that, you know, take advantage of folks' interaction with uh, shows and whatnot. And I think, you know, that's truly where it gets beyond just sharing Twitter with your friends or whatever. So I think, you know, there are going to be continued opportunities of how you get your brand message out, how you enjoy content beyond just, you know, what you're broadcasting on and on whatever platform. So I think, you know, it's truly um, become a real part of everything we do around a show, whether it's to promote it or to further uh, the brand. I can just add, and I don't know, I don't know that it really speaks to social media, but it, it was an interesting development for us. We just completed our first season of a show um, called The Awesomes that um, was exclusively for Hulu, and um, it was extremely successful. It was from the creators, was a couple creators, guys from um, Saturday Night Live, and it had a bit of star power behind it, and people watched it, and it, and it was a really interesting difference between what we're used to with networks and, and tune-in times and people um, going and picking up their iPad or their phone and watching a series that we create, so that was really good for us. <laughs> Um, if I can add one thing, I think the focus for us really is technology. Um, technology has essentially transformed um, the entire business. In the old film days, where it would take days and days to shoot and produce content and get that footage in a format that could be viewable by executives and others who needed to be part of a review and approval process, technology has shortened what used to take days into an overnight process. And that's where a company like ours has really been able to leverage the technologies, digital cameras, um, processors that we use in our uh, facility to help get that into different formats that then get pushed downstream and can easily be viewed 
in Los Angeles or anywhere in the world, really, because they're viewed, um, they're streamed. Um, it's, it's essentially enabled us to enter the marketplace in Atlanta or really anywhere and facilitate communication between people who are here and all around the world. Um, as I mentioned, I write um, about the entertainment industry for the Atlanta Constitution, and something kind of funny um, this week, um, Fast and Furious started filming this week, seven, Fast and Furious 7. Um, and so I posted a little blog um, item about it the other day with some photos from, from the set, and so these, these commenters you know, go on there, on there and um, you know, add their two cents. And so again and again, people were saying, why are they filming this in Georgia? And I thought, where have we all been? Um, but it, it speaks to, you know, maybe a bit of an opportunity for education to, you know, maybe raise Atlanta's profile and, and to, I guess, establish Atlanta and Georgia, you know, more firmly, not only in the minds of, you know, industry experts like you all, but just, you know, in, in the public in general. Can you all talk a little bit about, you know, what needs to happen to, um, to allow Atlanta to claim its rightful place in the, you know, burgeoning and ever-growing film broadcast? Um, uh -huh. I'll also steal Mr. Katz's line about the tortoise. I mean, I think we've started it. We have to, you know, continue to do the work, continue to do good work, uh, or even great work. I, I think that's really the, the key. And then, you know, slowly you'll start to realize that people will get used to the fact that, hey, there's another movie, or oh, I recognize that was shot in Atlanta and whatnot. And what I'd love to see, and I think it's something, you know, kind of a challenge for groups like this, is that to go beyond just the production to get more into post-production. There's you know, a whole untapped market, and I know you touched on games and interactivity, and I know that comes up later, that you know, it's, it's not just you know, what used to be called films, it's a much broader spectrum of what content is and whatnot. So I think we slowly have to continue to do the good work and continue to look at those other opportunities that you know, start establishing this as a hub versus just a great place to run and do production and fly home. Actually, uh, Fast and Furious is a movie actually that, that we're currently working on. No, maybe, maybe. And 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 and, uh, and 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 what I would, what's interesting, I mean, about about um, about this is that what's happened in Georgia is that there's been consistency, and through that consistency in, in the legislation, and because um, the original. Crafters of legislation did not put a sunset provision in the legislation, which um, Louisiana has and North Carolina has. Um, the studios, in particular, uh, feel very confident about the longevity of the program, which gives them uh, uh, the sort of uh, a feeling that they can invest in Georgia in building those relationships with, with companies like ours um, to go in it for the long haul. And, uh, and any sort of uh, talk, and that's what's going on in North Carolina, is they, they, may re they may renew it, they may not renew it. It's making the studio executives who are deciding where to put movies very, very nervous. Isn't that why Hunger Games 2 and now 3 yes. came on down here? Because you know, Hunger Games was filmed originally in North Carolina, and then Catching Fire was here, and Mocking Jay's about to crank yep. up here. Exactly. So the... the, the, the uh, Consistency on that level is, is the big thing. And then through that consistency, uh, you'll start to develop more talent here, more teams, better infrastructure, and the ecosystem for making movies becomes a holistic environment. Uh, we're now uh, two years in Georgia, and uh, to your point, up till now, everyone comes here and they shoot and then they leave. But now we are starting to see requests. Hey. Can you guys do the complete finish for the movie in Atlanta? Can you do the visual effects here in Atlanta? And so as we're starting to get uh, this sort of longevity now here, uh, the roots are really starting to take hold. The artists are coming. Uh, people are relocating. So you have um, cinematographers who used to live in Los Angeles now are making their permanent residence in Georgia, in Atlanta. Um, you're getting visual effects artists that are relocating here. And so as that ecosystem uh, becomes more developed and, and, and deeper, we will sort of continue to, to make our claim as a, as a, as a content hotbed uh, on par with New York or Los Angeles or, or soon to be maybe even better. Um, I was just going to say that recently, very recently, I, I was watching the Today Show just as a matter of course in the morning, and I want to say the mayor of Los Angeles was 
was on and they were interviewing him and did you see it? And he was basically asking everyone in the city for help. He's like, listen, we are losing this work. It is going away. We need to do something. And it's on the Today Show and I'm sitting there brushing my teeth or whatever thinking, you know, this has really happened here. And they had a graphic of the United States and they had a star over Hollywood and it just floated down to Atlanta. And I couldn't believe my eyes and I thought, that's, it's, you know, it's on the Today Show. It's really happening. And, and here's the mayor terrified of our city. And we have to, we have to stop thinking of ourselves as um, Atlanta, uh, Hollywood of the South, or, or that, that sort of thing. We need to establish ourselves as Atlanta and Georgia and, and um, stop comparing our, ourselves to the other, the other places. And as far as your question about how do we educate people, I mean, I think it's floating up. The cre Creative Loafing had a great article in July that came out that educated in general, like the, the layman about the tax credit and what it meant and why you're seeing all these production trucks. And I think we are all to, it's a topic that's all near and dear to our hearts and we're close to it, but for the general you know, population, population, they just are annoyed by the film shoots here and there, don't really understand why. And I think it's going to take a little bit of time, but it's already happening that everyone's gonna be um, more understanding of why it's here. It's, it's you know, rising tide floats all boats. It's helping real estate. It's helping you know, hotel and inter entertainment and all these industries are, are really getting affected um, by it. And so everyone will start to latch on to this idea that, the, that, that bringing it here helps everyone. And I think, you know, it's up to you guys at the AJC and the other media outlets to, to explain, keep explaining to them why. Well, I promise you, I mean, I'm, I'm active on Twitter and just round the clock, people are like, I saw a sign around the corner for me, what's filming here, right? And people wanna know right now, like what is going on right now, who's there? And, and by the way, where are they staying? And can you get me their autograph? And can you show the director my script? And I'm like, um, I can help you with one of those. Um, given the speed, you know, of, of you know, ever evolving technology and also the, the speed and the somewhat fickle nature of audience um, preferences. Talk a little bit about the challenges that you have, not only of staying current and, you know, even ahead of the game technologically, but also aligning what you do with, you know, your audience appetite. Um, we're pretty fortunate that uh, we have the resources to kind of pay attention to things. You know, we, we you know, obviously are, care very much about what we're doing day to day, uh, we have a lot of really smart people looking ahead at, hey, what impacts do, do these technologies have? And in fact, what technologies do we not have you know, that we need? We've rapidly gone from a tape-based world to a file-based world. I think you alluded to of how, you know, literally we get files now from cameras on set. We can get them at least overnight, if not same day. So that, the speed at which you know, we're able to work with information, get things on the air is huge. The not so fun technology part of that is you gotta keep that stuff somewhere. You have to have high speed ways to actually transfer that. You have to have secure ways to transfer that. You know, you're, you're essentially sending camera masters for shows that have not aired yet. So you really have a lot of not so fun things but really lucrative technology pieces and infrastructure that you know, we need to work on and, and get in place. So that's kind of a constant thing of filling those gaps that exist. And then beyond that, you know, you'll start hearing more if you haven't already about 4K. Uh, we've been living in the 4K world from an acquisition standpoint, cameras, um, but actually getting that to your, your screen and having a much larger TV, if you don't already have a large TV, you'll have a much larger one, perhaps in the future. And I think the interesting thing is, is that that's all things that we look at of, hey, how does that impact? And, you know, that in particular is huge infrastructure change, so it becomes, well, what other avenues are there to get that kind of content, you know, particularly around, you know, say, you know, sports will be one of the drivers. Uh, film and entertainment stuff will probably drive a lot of that. So a lot of it is good old-fashioned R&D, what works, what companies, um, what avenues do you have to pursue now that you didn't, you know, before? And certainly, from our perspective, you know, over the air broadcast, that much data uh, is problematic. So you start looking at, well, what other ways do you get it into the home? And certainly, you know, Google, YouTube, uh, is already putting a lot of things in place to, you know, partially control that. So that's, to us, a challenge is that at some point down the road, uh, they support a codec, uh, VP9, that is a 4K codec, very good quality, great compression. It's already in Chrome, I believe. So, and I think it comes to YouTube very, very soon. So there's things like that that are going to be sort of competition to getting what we used to do, um, kind of the only stop for it, 
there's gonna be a lot of other ways. So we have to look at getting that same content that we've always done to homes as, as quickly as anyone else. I think you know, those are definitely challenges you know, for us. I would also add, we use technology a little different in working with brands. So we actually are working with um, Cartoon Network and one of the other networks at Turner Upwave, which is a new like health and beauty one that they've started digital first and they're moving it to linear broadcasting. They've enlisted us to help identify topics that people are searching for actively. And um, I think that really answers the, how do we keep up with an audience and what they're looking for? So we use search and all the crazy algorithms and everything and can say, oh, look, people are really looking for, for the health and beauty, you know, six pack workouts. So um, the Turner teams have been really great at figuring out how they can turn around content quickly enough to then launch literally within couple weeks on YouTube and see how it performs. So, you know, we're using technology to help identify what people are really searching after, at least on the web. And it's a great testing platform then to see if it's worth the investment for larger productions like TV and film. One of the stories I saw over the weekend, I think it's the New York Times, it was really interesting that it kind of resonated with me as I prepared for today. It was about how um, NFL stadiums are kind of moving beyond just like, here's the game. And, and they're offering these huge, super VIP luxury lounges where you can go in, and they, they've um, centered on the Jacksonville Jaguars stadium, where you can go watch the game, but then there's also this VIP lounge where you can go play video games, you can play you know, all these different NFL-themed games, you can watch every other game that's going on. And so the game that's happening like five feet from you is like in the background, because you're there to play you know, Madden Xbox or whatever it is. Um, and it sort of um, it st struck me that, you know, it's not enough just to say, like, here is our product, come consume it. Um, talk a little bit about how, um, you know, the challenge of kind of hitting people on a number of their different, you know, you know sensories or, or just, like, offering a number of entry points to your product. I'll at least try to start it. Uh, um, and you kind of mentioned, yeah, stadiums, you know, wireless throughout the stadium, so you can Twitter with folks. I think what we all, you know, start to see is that people want to, you have to give them, you know, what they're asking for. How do they want to consume the things they want to consume and when? So I think, you know, a lot of things that we do are, you know, things around second screen, uh, you know, where there's interaction with the show, there's other, you know, features and behind the scenes pieces they can find out that you really start to identify who are those real true fans and give them more. Um, you know, I, I just think it's, yeah, you, you really are focused on what do people want to see, you know, beyond just what you're showing and, and where you can capture, you know, that experience on, you know, a second screen app or something that that's really, you know, again, and, you know, from here, you know, you kind of have all heard the word cord cutting. There's a, a new one now, they're kind of called cord cheating, where I'm not completely cutting it off, but I'm also, you know, I'm realizing there's other ways to get shows and movies and, and things that I might want to see. So you're seeing a lot of that. So part of it does, you know, again, becomes finding, hey, how, what are those other avenues to get my content to that viewer the way they want and when they want? And I think that's going to be consistently a challenge uh, for companies like ours and really any, anybody doing content. Yeah, so for, for us, it's, it's interesting because um, we're not the ones that are just sort of deciding on what the content is or how these sort of second screens are being deployed, but we're tasked with having to deal with the extra content as a result of it. And generally uh, speaking, whether it's a... Yeah, we're probably the ones asking for the extra is, content. Is, is, is an ad that would be a, may, maybe, a, maybe a commercial that would typically be a 30 second or 60 second commercial, but now it has a three second, a, thir a three minute web film that goes alongside of it. And what are the budgets that are associated with doing that work uh, for the three minute film are much less than what the 60 second commercial was. And how do you do work that looks as good as the, third, as the 60 second commercial does in a three minute web film for a fraction of the cost? And so that's one of the drivers I think as well that people are looking for places to do work where it is more economical uh, to do that work. And so that's uh, another reason as well as for movies, when it used to be that they would do a, an anniversary reissue of a movie and they would give you deleted scenes and all this sort of things as an after the fact. Now they're planning it. 
In fact, they're actually shooting extra material just for it. In some cases, there's a, a movie that, that we've done recently where they've actually shot a second movie to do then a second release that's going to include this other second movie. And, and so it's, a, it's a, the digital realm and shooting digitally has, has just uh, completely unburdened productions from how much they can photograph. Uh, they used to have to be very disciplined in how much they would film because it was a, a physical cost to how much they shot in purchasing film and processing. And now it's digital, they just keep recycling the cards through and shoot and shoot and shoot. So from a technology standpoint, we have to sort of build infrastructure to handle this sort of avalanche of content. And how do we deal with it in an expeditious fashion? How do we archive it and protect it uh, so that we don't lose it? And, uh, and it's, a, it's a very um, difficult task to sort of stay above uh, on because it, it moves so quickly and the file sizes are just growing exponentially. I was just going to add, I was telling Rihanna before the before the panel, we, we just got approached by a network that um, they've sort of changed their pilot model in, in a way, and they've, they've moved um, what typically they, they shoot their pilots, they test them, or they put them on air, and, um, and, and sort of make the decision there to a digital model where for a lot less money than we typically do a pilot for, they want a series of, of digital content, not just one piece, but several shorter pieces. And, and they want to put it out there and test it that way. And, and it, it's definitely a different approach, and it's definitely more challenging to keep that production value somehow, especially with animation. It, you know, it's, it's how many frames you're drawing per second. It's always going to be that way. So we're sort of tasked with, with keeping that production value, but um, for less money. And, and because it's digital content, everybody seems to think that's OK right now. And I don't know if that's ever going to turn around that we we start thinking of it as not the cheap place to put things. I mean, you guys are working on building those production values, and, and I think we all kind of have to work together to make sure everybody knows that digital, things we create for digital, the digital screens, you know, can have the same budgets that they do for, for network or, or film. 